Hello and a very warm welcome to Cloud Conversations. This is episode 27, I'm pretty sure. And uh, my name is Peter Rising, which I hope you all know by now. And I'm going to give a very warm welcome back to, to Rue Campbell, who has uh, had a little bit of a break from the show, a couple of episodes off, but we've been in the very good company of our new co-host, Kat Greenan, in the, in the meantime. But Kat's taken a a well-earned break now, so hey, maybe it's my turn next. But how are you doing, Rudy? Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good, uh, and you won't be getting a break. This is this is your <laughs> life now. I'm sorry, <laughs> but no, I'm not. All good here. All good here. And uh, you know, I've got the, the pleasure of introducing uh, today's host. Uh, today's oh. host. Well, that's me. <laughs> that's you. Today's guest. That's going to be Stephen Rose uh, from Microsoft. So Stephen's a Microsoft team senior product marketing manager. Uh, although we'll get into the fact that as far as Microsoft marketing of product goes, Stephen's been all over the place. So we'll talk about his history there, find out about all the cool stuff he's worked on. Uh, and where you may know Stephen from is he's currently the host of Inside Microsoft Teams. Uh, and he's just a kind of all round mainstay of Microsoft for IT pros. Uh, at least when I look back and my when I worked in internal IT, uh, you were one of those faces that I've seen all the time promoting the products, getting the news out there. So really glad to have you here. Uh, and how are you? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, gentlemen. I appreciate oh, it. Good stuff. So I guess, you know, I'll, to kind of kick us off here, I'll, I'll pick yeah. up on that then because, uh, like I said, you've worked on a whole bunch of products. Teams is obviously the big one now, but I'm also aware you've worked on uh, Windows and OneDrive and just spreading the knowledge yeah. that these products exist. And so can you talk to us a little bit about how you got into Microsoft and how that shaped about over time? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny because before coming to Microsoft, uh, I owned my own consulting company for about 15 years, was doing IT pro consulting and then partnered up with a really good friend of mine who is now also a Microsoft employee um, who is, was a developer. And we were walking into companies saying, you know, we could take those gigantic racks and racks and racks of servers. And this is pre-cloud. We're talking 2005 through 2008. Um, we can put those into these gigantic HP 64 core, 128 gig single servers. And what we did was, and we'll virtualize the environment. We'll actually put it into a VM. Um, which is great for developers because then they can ship those VMs back and forth and work together and we can spin up new domains, new projects very quickly. And then Daniel was building really cool front ends for our customers that would tie into this. Our goal was to have software that talked to each other so that you could really get a full 360 on your customers. And that was great. Um, I was also through my MVP stuff that was during the Vista timeframe. And Vista, as we all know, had gotten a bit of a rough rap, but I wasn't working for Microsoft, but I downloaded Surface Pack 2 and went, hey, Vista's now usable. Like yeah. all the USB stuff worked and they had some really cool features. And I was going out and I was doing events. And one day I get a call from Microsoft and um, they're like, who, who are you? And I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> they're like, you did an event in Southern California for 200 people and you had an 82% positive rating for windows vista who the hell are you <laughs> uh, some guy talking about all the good stuff that people sort of gave up on and just trying to try so um mark rasinovich at the time was hosting a show a virtual roundtable show and i got invited to be a guest on his show at microsoft and gave all and little did i know it was actually an audition because somebody had pointed out that the problem with windows marketing was uh, for you know, Windows marketing for IT pros was there wasn't anybody with an IT pro background, right. and the stuff they were putting out was just as you would say, shite. It was it was horrible. <laughs> I love it. I got on a call with them, and I'm like, this is how you think IT pros think. I'm like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. And I have an IT background, and I have a business you know background. I have a business degree. So through a long, interesting set of circumstances, uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I came on board to launch the Windows Seven beta. Uh, so I started with that and stayed with Windows 7, launched Windows 7, launched Windows 8, and actually launched Windows 10. I moved from the worldwide group to the U.S. sub. And what was funny was when Windows 10 came out, I'm standing in front of audiences and I'm like, have to remind them like, hey, let me remind all of you. You all hated Windows 7 when it came out. Mm. 
you loved your XP, you hated Windows 7, you thought it was a huge piece of crap. Matter of fact, there was a great cartoon in Penny Arcade when the Windows 7 beta came out. And he loads it up and he's like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm playing with the Windows 7 beta. He goes, what is it? He goes, oh, it's Hitler's face and the eyes light up and the eyes flash. <laughs> It's still better than Vista. And I'm like, look, we just got compared to Hitler and we barely won. Okay. You know, that's, but um, I felt bad because then Windows XP was, you know, going away a few years ago and I started apologizing to people. I'm sorry. I did too good a job in getting you to believe in Windows 7, but uh, I did Windows and then I went over to OneDrive because um, Jeff Teeper talked to me and they were going to relaunch uh, OneDrive. They were going to completely redesign it from the ground up and get rid of that Groove.exe. And I remember yeah. Groove and using Groove back in the day. And they're like, we need somebody to come in and really help us to understand IT pros and how we get folks to use this and all of that. So I went on board with that. That got me introduced to the M365 group, which is where I thought was really our future. And I got lucky. They, um, they did some reorganization and said, we really need someone who understands IT pros because we've got a group of marketers um, on how to do teams. And I said, I would love to do that. And I said, but only if I can do a show that really talks with customers and really talks to not the why teams, but how, how did you do it? And what did you learn and what went right and what went wrong and what should people look at differently? And that has been a, a really great success for me and for our users and folks have gotten great stuff out of it. And I love doing the show. Uh, I also own um, docs.microsoft.com, so our, our mm. landing page there, and we redid it and did stuff there. So I, I get my hands at a variety of things that I love, but the great thing is it's it's all IT pro, and it's me listening and hearing what folks have to say about the product and then sitting down with our engineering and our various departments and figure out what we can do to solve those problems and bring it to fruition. So I'm super mm. happy. It's been great. Yeah, I'm coming up on... Uh, October is going to start my 14th year at Microsoft now. So it's been a while. Awesome. There's two things you said there, Stephen, that made me feel very nostalgic. The first one is OneDrive related, and that is I've just remembered. I've completely forgotten this. It used to be called SkyDrive, didn't it? It was SkyDrive, yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, we got in that big legal issue with uh, the SkyDrive folks in the UK. And yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing was um, is Vista. Um, at the time Vista was out, I had just been appointed as IT manager for a, a seafood company in, in the UK here who were opening up a new plant, a new division near me. And my job was to, to get the IT up and running. And I chose to put Vista in. I put Vista in. Not only did I put Vista in across the board, I put it in with Citrix uh, presentation server, I think 4.5, I think it was. I've not touched Citrix in wow. a, a long time now. Do, 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 we... do, do, do a little IPX, XPX there. Very nice. Yeah, exactly. And um, the weird thing is, though, I had no issues. It ran like a dream. Yeah. Um, so there, you, there you go. A little, a little Vista success story for you. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, Vista, Vista when it came out, it was pushed out too soon. They had to, they had to mm. hit a deadline, and they pushed it out, and it just wasn't ready. The USB plug and play support wasn't there. Mm. And today, mm. that sounds like such a ridiculous thing to say, <laughs> yeah. but it wasn't there. The support for PCMCIA was not there yet for those who wanted to do, you know, additional Wi-Fi and stuff like that. And that was just not there. And they fixed all that with Service Pack 2 and turned it into a very solid operating system that really did become the base of Windows. But it just took a long time to get it there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad somebody else enjoyed it and figured it out. Absolutely. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned there that kind of made me think was that in a lot of ways that I guess the work that you guys do and as, as marketers and uh, forcing that adoption, when it comes to software that will eventually go end of life, I'm thinking XP, I'm thinking 7, I'm thinking eventually 10, mm -hmm. you can almost do too good a job of instilling <laughs> it as saying this is so good and it makes everyone afraid to leave it, right? Yeah. It, it does. But then again, like I said, you have to go back and remind them, you hated this when it came out. You said, yeah. I'm not going to change and I'm not going to do this. So give us a little bit of trust when we talk about this stuff. So at least I had a good track record with seven. Uh, I kind of lost some of that with eight because, you know, I don't think that we really, we didn't listen to IT pros. Um, you know, a lot of people were that moved into different roles. Or the we tried to be something that was not what our audience wanted. We did not listen to IT pros. And we learned that lesson. And I think we came back very strong with Windows 10. You know, folks 
really loved and went, thank you for getting back to the basics and, and making it better. And I said about 11, I've been running data since it first came out. And, um, it, you know, I think there are some great tweaks that make it a really solid operating system. And I think once people use it, it's a lot of little things that will help you to save time in your day and make it easier to move back and forth through work uh, rather than big dramatic changes that force you to relearn a lot of things. And mm. I mean, one of the big things that I guess might assist adoption, and maybe you can talk a little bit about this, is the integration of Teams into Windows 11, right? We've got this concept now that me, I guess, coming from uh, more of the security background and the productivity background, I'm not up to speed on it. But there's this term that's floated about called Teams 2.0, which is, you know, advertised being kind of part of Windows 11. Can you touch upon how that might improve lives for folk and why that might be an incentive to upgrade? Yeah, I think, you know, for that, it's part of our Teams for Life, which is our private or family version of Teams that people have said, you know, I miss Skype. Skype is now going away, although it's still available for personal. But even though I'm in maybe my Teams for Business, I wish there was a way that I could also add my family or chat mm -hmm. with other people that are not part of the team and be able to have a chat go back and forth and do that. And what we've done was we've integrated a personal chat and a personal version of Teams uh, separate from your business version, which is locked down. And you can, of course, say can't drag and drop things into that or monitor, you know, um, the aspects of what's being done with it. But it does give a way for people to be when they're sitting to not have to move between devices. Some people are going to love it and say, hey, this is a great thing for my kids because I got kids on iPhone and on Android and all the rest. And I can't use my phone for everything. So this really fills in some gaps for some folks. They're going to go you know what, not my cup of tea and not something I, I want to work with. And I'm just going to turn that off. And, and you can do that too, if, if you choose to do so. But I think by integrating that in and giving people that option, Mac folks love it. And I think that's one of the things with iChat built in, where you can mix that business and personal and Android does that as well with several apps. I think it's great. We're giving people the choice, but we've also made it very, very easy to, to turn that off if you choose that that's not something you want within your environment. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, and it does work brilliantly on Mac, I have to say, because I've uh, my, my personal device is a Mac. Uh, mm -hmm. My my work device is a a, a lovely Surface um, laptop, which I which I love. So I've got two great devices, and, and Teams just just works brilliantly on both. So yeah, absolutely. Agree. And, and I work across all platforms. I have a Mac. I have an iPad. I have an Android phone that I use. I have mm -hmm. a Surface Studio here and a Surface laptop in the office, and I love the fact. And that's one of the things that we talk about is with really taking that first step, which is putting your, your getting rid of that X drive and moving that into SharePoint and mm. using the known folder move to you know move your desktop, my docs and photos to the cloud, mm. you open up a, a, just a ton of really great possibilities. And with COVID, the one thing that we heard from folks is, I wanna be able to work from anywhere on any device. Mm. And being able to do that so seamlessly. And I love the fact that I can start something on my laptop in, at home, go to a coffee shop, sit down, pop open my iPad, reopen that document, continue to work on it, add some edits, close it. And then if somebody has a question, can upload it to Teams and drop it in with a comment without you know, even thinking about it. And also knowing that that document is completely secure, mm. that it's completely protected has really changed how people work. And I think it's interesting because for the first time ever, we have four generations of workers in the workplace. We have boomers all the way up to Gen Xers and we'll have alphas in the next few years. And what's interesting is, you know, the boomers and, you know, that next generation, we're very much about, I've got a desktop unit or I've got a, a machine with a hard drive that's sitting right here in the monitor and all my software is on it. And I've got my X drive and I VPN in and that's how I work. Let me move to the next generation, which is, I was born in the cloud. I, you know, started with Google Docs or I started with Office 365 and all I need on my PC is a browser. And then we have our latest generation that says, there's no difference between my PC and my phone. It's just a way to get to my crap up in the sky. That's mm -hmm. all I need to do. I watched my daughter when she was in high school in the back seat, working with four other students and uploading things to you know OneDrive and to a SharePoint site and do all this faster on her phone than I can do on my laptop. So understanding that and how people want to work is 
what businesses are doing and need to do to be able to retain great talent and be successful is to understand that and realize that your 40% of folks you have on this side have got to start to move this way because this group, which is the one you want to keep, uses chat as their primary form mm -hmm. of communication. They're not using Outlook. Mm -hmm. Outlook is how you tell people there's donuts in the break room, but it's not how you get the work done. They want to chat, bring in somebody else, solve that issue, finish it, move forward, move on to what's next. So mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of that, and businesses are realizing this. People can be productive from anywhere on any device, and with the right tools, um, they're either going to love it and fall right into it, or they're going to see the success that other people are having and realize that, hey, we're going to have to move in this direction and start to use products like this. Whether it's our product or it's Salesforce or Zoom or you know any one of those, that's the future. And that's the direction that if you want to be successful 10, 15 years from now, that's the direction you're going to have to go because that's what people mm -hmm. want. Yeah, for sure. And if you don't do it, then folk are going to find a way around your systems and start doing it. Yeah. Anyway. They'll use the, yeah. the quote unquote shadow IT, right? You know, they'll just start using WhatsApp <laughs> and you don't yeah. want that because there's compliance purposes and all that kind of thing you right. need to account for. And so the really more, and, to... Yeah. And the more, the more control you have, the less control you really have because people have found those workarounds. Yeah. No, that, that uh, that's a great quote. I'm going to steal that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> It's true, though, you know, and it's funny because when I, with, with customers, I'll work in a whole bunch of different environments. Right. And it's amazing how second nature it becomes to you when you're able to use those the full cloud integration that 365 gives you right the co-authoring the auto save oh, yeah. the yeah. OneDrive going between desktop and web and it's just so smooth and then all of a sudden you have to pull in the brakes and connect to a VPN and use the spreadsheet and kick like, out and kick in. What are you doing? People. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and now from an even higher level of security, if you're really security, we'll use conscious slash paranoid, depending on where you are on that scale. Uh, we now have Windows 365, which means you could just mm. sandbox everything. Again, I've used Windows 365 on my iPad with a keyboard and a mouse, and it works great because there I am running my desktop, my Windows 11 desktop, all of my apps inside my iPad. And it's great. And I'm not having to do anything or, you know, get boot camp or anything like that, which really doesn't work on an iPad. It's more for a Mac, but be able to do that and then close out and everything there was secure and then go do the things that I like to do, the consumption apps and mail that I tend to do on my iPad. So being able to also take it to that level has really sort of changed the game, especially from a security standpoint. Yeah, mm. for sure. If, yeah, yeah, there's if been lots of that, strides, haven't there? If you've security. got that old school de uh, data loss prevention mentality and you say, no, it needs to stay in this container, that's right. where Windows mm. 365 kicks in, right? And Absolutely. And yeah. it works or, great, or just it works great with Teams as well. Yeah, or and that's the thing is with the the stuff we bought from FS Logics, that allowed Exchange and OneDrive and all of those tools to now work inside of virtual environments. Mm. That was really sort of the big thing, and that was one of the two big things when I was working on OneDrive. Is hey, we have millions of people that can't use OneDrive because we don't support the caching technologies mm. that we need, and we don't support Exchange. So we, you know, we we bought this company and brought it in and solved that very very quickly it was a it was a great acquisition and that really sort of paved the road for this very quickly because we were you know long before covid realized this was going to be something that folks want i i used to do the demo where i take an android phone plug it into a hub that had ethernet a keyboard a mouse and a monitor and say look and people go oh, yeah it's a pc i'm like no it's not it's a phone yeah. now you are truly connected you could have a driver who goes somewhere plugs in does their paperwork does whatever they need to do no wi-fi required and then pulls it out and moves on and goes to their next location and they're running this full windows pc experience wherever they go and doing it at a high fidelity and people are like oh wow that's that's kind of cool when you think about it and it is it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty neat yeah. yeah and teams has come such a long way in a very short space of time hasn't it it's i think it's about four and a half years old now something like that right it sounds about right yeah yeah and um and, and in that time we've seen such uh, innovation in it and in, in in recent times i mean the pre the most recent ignite that we had earlier in this year and we've got another one coming up so there's most good yep. stuff to come i have no doubt we saw some great stuff we saw webinars we saw uh the encryption capabilities we the, there's there's just so much stuff coming into teams all the time integration with uh viva insights and, and 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 stuff like that and this is the great thing about teams that i love that it just ties everything together the sharepoint onedrive um, 
Uh, and I just started with a new company recently. And one thing that it's made me realize is that this is the first company I've ever worked for that's actually using Yammer correctly. Really? Um, so <laughs> I, I, I was very, very impressed because I've always been a little bit skeptical of Yammer. I've always thought, where does this fit? What's it for? What's it yeah. doing? Why, why do we need it when we've got teams? Um, but it's in teams now. And, and, and this organization is using it quite um, quite a lot, quite deeply. And, and, I, and I thought, yeah, this is a great way to communicate one to many rather than all these emails being shoved around and, and getting lost and yeah. uh, in the old way of working. So, uh, so yeah, lots of great innovation. Would you, would you say in your time working with teams in the last four or so years, is, is there any particular thing that jumps out at you as being the biggest innovation, the thing that, you, that you're most proud of that you think is the biggest success? I think it, it's just listening to customers. I think, you know, mm. as we take a look at teams uh, and I've spent a lot of time with Jeff Keeper and, and his folks, especially back mm. in my OneDrive day. And we, I would sit in on the engineering conversations at the beginning of the season for OneDrive. And we'd always say there's kind of a engineering's a string. It's only this long. And if you want to add a feature, you got to pull it this way and something's going to fall off because there's only so many resources. But I think from a company level, we've done a really good job of separating evolution and revolution. And what, I, what do I mean by that? Um, evolutionary features are the ones that you have to have to stay current. These are, let's take this and make it better, or let's <laughs> add to this feature, or our competitor came out with that and we could add that easily. Those are evolutionary features, the ones that people expect. And then we have revolutionary features, things that nobody expected that we have brought in that people are like, wow, like the ability now in a pot, when you're having in the middle of a presentation that the end users can right click that presentation and see all the slides immediately translated into their own language. Mm. That's super cool. And that really changes things as you do it, the ability to have real time transcription. So folks who have, uh, a disability or really want to read what's being said that that's easier for them could go that way but i think what's interesting is my next guest is polaris on my show the people who make snowmobiles and indian motorcycles and all of that okay. and the cio made a great comment he's like i love seeing people chat in meetings because that's not something you could do in real life hmm. when people are having side conversations and laughing about something and talking about something, but it still pertains back to the topic. You can't do that during a meeting because then you'd be interrupting the person talking, but this allows people who could not get engaged to be able to be engaged in the meeting. Mm. And I know that they're engaged in thinking and doing it and nothing makes me happier than a really good side chat in teams. And I thought, wow, that's, that's opened up and allowing people to do something that they couldn't do before. So I don't think it's any one feature. I just think how we're allowing people to have a better work-life balance, mm. hopefully, to be able to kind of work from places that make them happy and allow them mm. to be productive um, mm. and bring that together and allow people who sort of sat in the sidelines of meetings a way to better participate mm. and to be part of this. And then if you're new to a project, a much easier way to get caught up on that rather than somebody sending you, go to our X drive, I'm going to forward you 60 emails and go through this rather than seeing a timeline of every meeting, every comment, every document, and really understanding where things are at. So I think it's really helped mm. us as a platform, a lot of people in many different ways to do better. And now we're going to focus on first line worker some of the great things that we're bringing that from walkie talkie to some of the other features. It really is how can we industries to have thought and better together to share ideas and to have less time, you know, spent on these old school processes that are frustrating and allows us and developers to build really great power apps. I've seen some amazing things written by people who've never written a lot of code. And all of that. I think it's a lot of those different things that I think has been the most exciting thing about this. And it's the big difference between having working for an application as opposed to working for a platform. Mm. I love that side chat that you mentioned in the meetings as well, because that to me is an, an inclusion feature because yeah. in, me in meetings, you get people who are confident in the limelight, want to talk, want to be heard. And there's more introverted people perhaps who who are not so comfortable mm. with that and they can, they can make their contributions in that way. So brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Love it. Cool. One, I, one question that kind of uh, 
I, I, I was meaning to ask you then was because you, you see how what makes teams so good it's not one particular feature it's the full mm. suite it's the way it all works together I yeah. guess when teams was first announced for a lot of us it's definitely not the case now but for a lot of us it was a case of okay interesting it's going to replace Skype we'll see right. how it goes when for you did the kind of penny drop that no this is going to be the product that is so encapsulate microsoft 365 when did it kind of occur to you that oh wait this is going to succeed outlook as what mm. folks use uh more the next than anything thing. else yeah 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 i you know what i don't even know if i've gotten to that point yet i certainly realize that it is a game-changing program but we still have so many people that are still doing and spending 90 percent of their day in outlook because we have such a diverse amount of users who aren't doing that where I hear is when companies have really embraced it. And I think for me, the aha moment was seeing in once COVID hit and people have to start working from home that they went, oh, I can now do this in Teams and this is going to be better. Or oh, we'll do a happy hour in Teams and we'll use this as a tool like this that they went back to the training and said, hey, what if we move this into it? We can automate this. That I think it was COVID that really helped people to look at the platform differently and really say, well, what if? Is there a better way to do this? And for the first time, your whole workforce was open to it because everything was turned upside down. So if you were gonna change something or try to do something different, that was the time because people are like, I don't know which way's up. All right, if we move one more thing and change it, let's do that. And people were empowered to say, how would you like to do this or what works best for you? And I think that's where we saw, and that's where I realized, hey, this Teams thing is really gonna go. So, um, you know, COVID is certainly, it's not a good thing or a lucky thing. And many, many people died and that's horrible, but mm -hmm. interesting innovation across the board, not just on teams, but, you know, as a country and as a world came across and how we look at things and look to do things. And we've had time to go back and rethink. And I think that's been a great moment for us to all pause and really go, what's really critical in our personal lives, what's really important in our personal lives and in our business lives, and how do we do this better? And I think hopefully we're all going to come out of this with a better appreciation, a better work-life balance, and a better way of not being at our desk from eight to five and not get up all day and find new and better ways to work. And I think businesses are seeing people are more productive when they can take a break and take their kids to school or have a long lunch or take a walk or work from a walk or do these things that it's better than when they're sitting at a desk and they're getting more done. It's that simple. Mm. Yeah. yeah. The, the flip side of that is um, that you can get teams fatigue. Uh, I agree completely with what you just said there, Stephen. Yes. I, I, it gives me the chance to do the school run in the morning and the pickup in the afternoon. But um, you're more available because when you were in person at an office or a customer site, for example, it was easier to hide, if you like. It was easier to focus <laughs> just on that. But now yeah. there's this perception that you – well, you should be available, um, right, rightly or wrongly. So, but what we're seeing now is with the with the advent of uh, of Viva uh, in, insights and uh, and well being and, and that sort of thing, uh, I, I'm certainly seeing improvements there. With let's let's think about this. Let's book in some focus time. Let's have the virtual commute to wrap up your day. Let's uh, right. do some headspace and uh, and let's have meetings not be an hour but 45 minutes or, right. or or 50 minutes so these are all great things that hopefully everyone is, is starting to learn to do because there has been teams burnout for sure i've been on days and i'm sure we all have where yeah. we've just gone meeting 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 and it's where's the pause but yeah. uh but things are happening to 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 to, to train us to evolve our, our behavior and, and and how we use it which is a great thing which i love so no, I, I agree. In our organization, um, we have what's called a no meeting Friday. So on Fridays, mm -hmm. you cannot have meetings starting at noon unless everybody has agreed to have it. And there are times you have to. We're getting close to Ignite, things like mm -hmm. that. But in general, Friday afternoons are your time. And it's great. You can take that time off. You can sit and just do email. But um, that's been really great for me because then I go, that, that's a Friday project. I need to go through some scripts or I need to do this stuff where you don't want to be bothered. And what's great is everybody's really respectful of that. So that's mm -hmm. also made a big difference, making sure that from five o'clock on Friday till about five o'clock on Sunday, I'm not doing any work unless, you know, it's very close to a conference or I'm prepping for a keynote or something that I'm not doing that. And the same, I turn off teams at nine o'clock. It's off. Mm -hmm. And if somebody tries to catch me, it'll go to email and people have learned at 9 p.m., you're not going to get an answer till the morning again, unless it is a special thing. And we've agreed in advance that 
you know, some things have to get done over this time. So setting boundaries is really important. And, um, and I think Viva really helps to see the cause and effect of that when what happens when a manager sends an email out at nine o'clock at night and how much disruption that makes to people's lives and things along that line. You know, how many people are multitasking in meetings because they don't have enough time to get done what they need to do. So mm. I think these are really useful tools. And a lot of companies are really looking at this and taking mental health, making it a priority, which is something that so many companies did not do before. And that makes me very happy as an advocate for mental health. Um, you know, I think it's super important. It's easy to get burnt out and um, mm. to hate your job, a job you love to hate it because you've had five days in a row of 30 minute meetings from eight to five. That's enough just to make every, anybody go bonkers. Plus you, there's no time to pee and that's just going to make you angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Or unhygienic. You know, <laughs> yeah. Important, you know? Yeah. No, it's, it's a good point. It's interesting to find out how you guys manage that internally with the, the idea of this kind of a uh, five o'clock noon cut over for, I guess, uh, no communication unless it's completely yeah. necessary from the sound of things that's a pretty cool idea and one of the things I've found I also started with a new uh, employer recently and I don't get uh, I don't get outlook on my phone and it's been kind of after you get over the initial uh, I guess muscle reaction of just mm -hmm. reaching into your phone and trying to look at your work email and your work calendar it's yeah. quite nice if I'm being honest uh, oh, yeah. you know it's just nice to switch off when you switch off it is. Yeah. When I go on vacation, my rule is I get up, I get up before the family. I go downstairs by the pool. I sit, I work for an hour, clean out emails. And then I tell people I won't answer for 24 hours. And now we have that mute feature in Outlook Mobile, which I love, where you can mute all the messages. And then that's turned on my whole trip. So unless it's an emergency, and if that's the case, you're going to call me, you don't do it. And it's really great for me because then all I'm using my phone for is just to take pictures. I'm not looking at email, not doing it. It's not showing up on my screen. And that really helps. And that's one of those things, too. And it's sad. I'm very American in that way where most people would go, you know, what do you mean you're working on your vacation? But we don't get as much. And, you know, it's mm. hard. The worst thing you want to do is take off 10 days and then have come back to a pile of stuff and you lose the the buzz of your vacation so by doing that i'm able mm. to come back and, and zip right into it plus we only get like a week to three weeks a year we don't get that whole month off in december or a nice holiday thing that you guys get so <laughs> yeah that, that always surprised me because i worked for an american-based company <clears throat> uh, a global company a few years ago and my colleagues in the states i was always surprised well we we take a really long christmas off in the uk as a as a general yeah. rule of thumb and my colleagues in the states they were back on the 26th they got the christmas day off and then back on the 26th what we call boxing day and then right like, what you're working tomorrow yeah. really so but i guess the thanksgiving as well which we don't have but uh which... yeah but, that, but that's only like a day plus like a float day and a lot of people do work on the friday but i tend yeah. to take off from about december 15th until like january 1st and that's that's yeah. my time well, you've got to family. use your own time for that yeah, yeah. I, and the company's pretty good about it they're like well if you were to check in on email once or twice a day that kind mm. of counts so they're, they're pretty yeah. good about it but things slow down after ignite we're good and then we t really hit the gas again in january so but mm. yeah i'm I, i'm always jealous of all my friends overseas that have a proper vacation proper holiday schedule <laughs> we've got a lot to be jealous of the americans though, to be fair you guys uh you guys have got a lot better food than we do that's it <laughs> It depends on where you're at. I, I don't, you know, it depends on where, like, you know, Ireland, I liked Ireland, but everything was boiled way too much for me. You know, it's just like, if you, there's going to make some food, you just boil it. I like the food in the UK. There's a lot of great stuff. Scotland, I had some really good food too. So, you know, it depends on where you're going. So yeah. I love, I miss getting out and traveling and mm. eating all different foods mm. and things like that. It just kills me. When I went, um, had a chance to go to Ireland about a year ago two years ago and I just I had all and I'm just Jones and to get back out there into India, which was amazing experience. And that's probably one of the best things I've had a chance to meet IT pros almost every corner of the globe and get a chance to travel mm -hmm. on the company's dime, go do this and eat some amazing meals, meet some phenomenal people and see some phenomenal things. So it's all good. And I miss that. I'm excited to get back to that hopefully soon. Yeah, soon, mm. hopefully. I'm hoping to be able to travel again on the company dime to Dublin in November, uh, nice. Dublin, Ireland, and, you know, have some 
good food and some good beer over there. That's so. where I went. I went to the Guinness factory and fell to my knees and wept. And it was great. There was a, <laughs> a SharePoint conference there. Here, you'll appreciate this. Hang on. This was the gift at the SharePoint conference was they gave us um, engraved Guinness glasses, our oh, own wow. Guinness glasses with our names engraved on them. It's kind of hard nice. to see there, but you can see that. Yeah, after, I can see that. Yep. Yeah, I got 17, it. Which was great. Yeah, and they awesome. did a party at the Guinness factory, and I'd gone early in the day, and I had done the beer pouring class and the whole thing. So during the party, they let me get behind the bar. I'm an ex-bartender and pour Guinness for the guests. So I'm like, I got to drink and pour Guinness at the Guinness factory. So that's ticked <laughs> off of my things I have to do before I'm gone from the, this gone, gone from this planet is go to the Guinness factory, drink Guinness there and serve a Guinness to somebody. So I did it. Nice. I was extremely happy. It was very cool. Well, see, I've oh, heard, awesome. and I don't, I don't know how true this is because uh, I've never been yet, but I've heard that the Guinness that you get over in Dublin, if you were to get it from the, the Guinness place is better than the Guinness you would get if you just oh, yeah. went to the supermarket. Is no, it's true? phenomenal. Oh, yeah. It's phenomenal. It's better than any of the ones I've had at British pubs, too, because the lines are really clean. And that's really mm -hmm. kind of the key is not to get any of that other sentiment in. So right. they're constantly cleaning their lines. It is sweet and wonderful and even more creamy than I've had in some of the best British pubs. Uh, it was phenomenal and then they have all that they have that they have the guinness amber the regular they have all the different types the guinness silver and you can try them all and they give you a little guinness smelling they have all the ads they've ever had it's <sighs> it's a great tour to go over there and um and and get your guinness at the end you get up to the top and there's the 360 degree bar where you get your free guinness and yeah. you get to sit overlooking all of dublin i was wearing my my guinness shirt and uh, you know, was drinking my Guinness, and I was having my checklist. One, one more thing off of the things I have to do before I die. Last moment, so it was great. I am, I'm salivating now. I need to, <laughs> <laughs> need to change the subject quickly. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so moving on uh, before <laughs> I on. start drooling all over the mic. Uh, I get. Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the show that you host. So yeah. uh, inside mm -hmm. Microsoft Teams, right uh, now. You, you you do this kind of seasonally, right? And I just want to check, mm -hmm. am I right that you air the show almost entirely live? Because I'm wondering what are the kind of logistics that have to go behind that to make yeah. it all work? What we do is, is we actually record the show live. So we were doing it live for the first two seasons. And we said, you know what? We think we could do more segments and do things better if we pre-record it like a live show, like one take, that's it. Cut in if we have additional things and then broadcast it along with anybody who was on the show there to answer questions. Because we realized that was the big problem is if you're on the show, it's very hard to do that and answer questions. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do now is we pre-record it ahead of time, but it's a single take with our guest and then the other segments, and then we push it out as a live show. What's great is also we can have our translation and transcription on all that done. So when we push it out on the website within a few hours after we do it, it's ready to go. And then we've also now been putting it up on YouTube where we found a, a huge audience in addition to the audience that's currently viewing our show. So it's, um, it's been great and super enjoyable. I don't script questions. I interview my guest, kind of hear mm -hmm. what's important to them. I sort of weave the story and my goal is not the why team, how, what have we learned? What have they learned by rolling out teams? What would they do differently? What were the big mistakes? Lego really talking about how, this fits into they're always looking for new ways to collaborate which is what their toys are all about and how they've you know are early adopters of almost everything versus a company who says we were really slow and we didn't get buy-in from management it failed so we have to go back mm. and relook it so it's been great to hear the experiences from companies like AEG who own the O2 arena and you know the the LA Lakers and to hear from um, like I said, Polaris and Lego and, um, you know, all of these other companies, school systems, et cetera. And how did they figure this out and make this work? And um, it's been a really great show. Uh, and I've learned a lot. And we've heard from a lot of folks that are watching it to do it. So we do um, each season is six months. So we're mm -hmm. in season four now. So we're just at about two years of the show. So it's been great. Nice. Awesome. And do you find that that platform I've, I, I'm, I've got my own answer in mind, but do you find that that platform makes it easier for folks to digest that? Because to me, 
Microsoft, they publish a lot of blogs, a lot of tech community articles, but there's just something about the format of video and doing it like a mm -hmm. show that just makes it easier to, to keep up with, I guess. I think for some people, I think the big thing for me is it's a little more personable and connecting. And I'm, you know, as someone who loves to get up on stage and, you know, do a session. And my favorite part is afterwards when hearing all the questions from folks and what they thought and can we do this and that back and forth, because that allows me to go back to, you know, our teams in engineering and say, hey, I hear this a lot. And I've had 12 customers say this, and this is a problem or this is working really well. How do we work it better? That back and forth, I think, is super important. And I've said anybody who's in marketing, if you're not standing or listening to a live audience every, you know, two to three months and getting feedback, we're missing the point. And one of the things that I keep saying is it's great. Like at Ignite, we're going to talk about all the new stuff that's here, but we have so many customers who are still way back here hmm. who are just now using some of the features that we talked about two, three years ago. They don't care about this new thing. They're like, I'm still trying to figure out, uh, you know, Azure Connect and how I'm going to set up external users and how, what am I going to allow from a security standpoint? So we always have folks going in that. And I think it's really important. And that's one of the things I was able to do with the show is to go back to those points and help those folks who are now just getting on that train and doing it, not the folks who have been with us since day one. So, and it, that's an ever cyclical cycle. So I think that that's super important. And that was one of the reasons for doing this was to go back to address this and say, here's what you want to think about now before you get to that point. And hopefully it's been successful in that. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. There's, um, the, you've, you've got an, an amazing team around you as well. I mean, uh, two names immediately spring to mind of, of great people who work alongside you, uh, Holly Lehman, Laurie Potmeyer. Yep. They've uh, both do amazing, amazing work uh, for Microsoft and in the, in the wider community. I believe Holly's recently just joined the team's team as well. A big change for yeah. her. And, uh, Holly, both... I've been mentoring Holly for years and mm. uh, there was an opening on the team and I went to her and said, hey, I think this would be a great opening for you. Plus I've, I've wanted to work with her because she's just an amazing person and she has that passion for community mm. um, that I have, that Laurie has. So it is so great to have her. She's doing such an awesome job. She's leading a lot of our Ignite stuff, but always with that eye on how do we get MVPs involved? How do we get community mm. involved? How do we do this sort of stuff? And it's really nice not to be that only voice in the desert. So yeah. uh, it's great to have her. And Laurie is amazing. She did a phenomenal job on our show uh, this week, which featured MVP videos. And she's great to work with and partner up on how do we create opportunities for our MVPs at Ignite. We're going to be doing some round tables. How do we get MVPs involved? Mm -hmm. We're doing a customer panel. How do we get MVPs on board? And she's always looking for those opportunities. And so am I. So it's great to have somebody on that side of the house who's doing that. So mm -hmm. having the two of them together has just made my job a lot easier. So I'm super happy that they're both uh, doing great and doing what they do. Yeah, both both uh, previous guests on this show, and uh, we we yeah. we love them, great great folks. But um, yeah. the um from from the MVP side of things as well, the MVP standpoint. I mean, you and I first sort of uh, came across each other, Stephen, earlier in this year when we worked together at Ignite on the mm -hmm. um, Ask the Experts Ask the Experts session. Get yeah. my teeth in. <laughs> Ask the Experts Security Session. Yeah, try saying that one five times. <laughs> Ask the Experts Security Session. Yeah, and that, yeah. that was really good. It's it, and and the MVPs. I mean the they are so, as a rule, so passionate about this. And when you get together with Microsoft, the, the chat goes crazy. The ideas are flowing. And you must get so much from the MVPs oh, um, God, in yeah. terms of ideas. So that's uh, it's absolutely brilliant that that channel is there. So um, with Ignite coming up, though, that's, that's good to hear that there's going to be opportunities to engage again. Yes. That's always music to our ears. And we, we love being involved. So can't wait to see what's to come. Um, yeah, Lori, Lori should be pushing something out in the next few days uh, coming up mm -hmm. this week. But we're just finalizing everything. But yeah, that's always how do we get them involved? How do we get them to answer these questions? How do we get them mm -hmm. to engage with our customers? Because uh, it's also important to you guys as part of your commitments. And I know you love hearing that feedback because it helps you mm -hmm. to hone your skills. It's just as important as it is to us. And like I said, in being a past MVP, that was the hardest thing for me to give up when I came to Microsoft because mm -hmm. out of all the certs that I had, it was the one that I had to earn that I just couldn't go out mm -hmm. and go take a test. So it was hard to give that one up. Yeah, yeah. We, hear, we hear that a lot on this show. We we, for example, Al Erdley, who was an MVP yeah. until he joined Microsoft, he kind of, he said it wasn't, the toughest decision to make because he'd always wanted to work for Microsoft, but he did, it did kind of stall him and he thinks, Hmm, I'm going to miss this, you know, yeah. because it is something that's, it's not really a cert, is it? It's well, it's, it's called the, the MVP award, right? Yeah. 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 
I guess and one of the things I'd, I'd be interested to run by you as someone who's made that leap. Uh, one of the because th- one of the things that I try to avoid is although the MVP award shows that you're obviously engaged in the Microsoft tech and the community to a certain level, I try not to be that kind of parrot that just always totes the company line. You kind of have to tell it to mm. folk, warts and all, right? And I'm yes. just curious, how do, <laughs> from from the inside of Microsoft looking out now, what are your kind of thoughts on what is the best things MVPs can do for both Microsoft customers and Microsoft? Like, what is the best thing they can do in their role as an MVP? Yeah, I, I think what you've said is so important because if you guys are just parroting back and saying what we're saying, then you're not doing yourself or any of your followers a service. I think if we're not doing something right, you should call it out, call us out on it. Do it respectfully. You know, I love this product, but they still have not fixed this. And this makes me crazy. And this is why I haven't moved up. If this is not an issue for you, go use it. But if this is, this is not working right. I know that the calling features, the PTSN and uh, the PT, uh, the, 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 you know, the calling yeah. features and some of the, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and some of our PBX stuff, it's just not working to the level that people want it to with Skype. We're working on it. And we've had MVP mm. saying it's not there yet. I use it, it's good, but here's what you need to fix. And we actually just did a session with a bunch of our MVPs last week saying, we took your feedback, here's what we fixed, here's what we're working on, here's their house is coming, and following up on there. And you should not lose credibility on our behalf. Not just going out and knocking something because everybody you don't like it. You know, if you, I know people who have said, yeah, Windows 11 is not really it. I'm like, how long you been using it? They're like, well, I downloaded Mm. the beta. It's on a second machine. Have you worked (laughs) with it every day on your main machine for Uh. two weeks? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, then you really shouldn't be in a place to diss it. If you haven't said, you know what? Here are four things that it is not doing as well as it was doing in Windows 10. Mm -hmm. Then that's fine. But also say, here are some of the things that I like about it. I think it's absolutely fine. And I think it's important. You guys should be the real world experts. And when your customers come to you and say, should I take this piece of software? I think there's nothing more valuable than you saying, not just yet. Mm. It's almost there. Mm. I would give it another six months or roll it out small. But these features are coming. I know because I've been in the meetings. And once these come, you want to get on this and you want to be there. Or only if you have this setup. Because if you're not using this, this security or you're not bringing this into it or not integrating um, you know, Azure Sentinel or, or Azure B2B or Teams Connect or whatever, it's not going to work as well for you. So I think that that's absolutely fine. Uh, I think that that's really important. And I think that's what you bring that we can't do. But as long as it's justified and not just to make noise or waves, then I'm 100% for it. And I will stand behind and back any MVP on that as long as they have, you know, are, are really speaking from a place of professionalism. Yeah, and we do know the Microsoft. Not the listens. answer you were maybe expecting, <laughs> but it is the right answer, and it's how I feel passionately and how I acted mm. as an MVP, and I would expect us to support you guys. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense, especially the fact about doing it professionally, right? I mean, yes. it, it's the easiest thing in the world to to scream and shout and troll about all the things that mm. are maybe wrong with something, but change isn't easy, right? Especially right. when you're operating at the scales that that you guys have to. So right. it's about doing it with professionalism uh and also with criticism yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah Yeah. i chatted with a customer and this is not working and you know the other thing is there are some times when we get feedback about something that they would like it to work this way but i go the way you want to use it is how about two percent of our folks are going to use it yeah as opposed we have to do what is you know best for the masses and there are some things we go Mm. yes that's great and i get it but and I, and I know that you would really love this. It just doesn't work for you, but you are a very small use case. I apologize. At some point, mm-hmm. maybe we will, but we've got to do things that impact and help the largest amount of people first or help us to go deeper into various verticals. That sometimes is hard for people to hear because they have a great idea, a great use case that we're not going to do for them. But, you know, it, that's going to be that way with every product and with every company. So, yeah, mm. well, there, there's a lot of stuff that, isn't seen by the customer, right? Or the end user. When, as soon as you commit to saying, okay, well, that feature's good. We're going to do that. You're not just committing to developing it. You're committing to managing it, ongoing, sustaining it, promoting it, putting the documentation in. There's a whole bunch extra that has Absolutely. to come about. And yeah. it's, 
at the end of the day, I guess it boils down to a lot of just resource management. You know, we, do, we don't have infinite people and we don't have infinite time. No. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Um, but um, one of the things that um, my, my mind has gone completely. This happens to me occasionally. <laughs> my brain freeze. It's happened to me a couple of times on the show. I had a point. I wish I knew what it was, but um, if you've got something, Rube. It's that big five all creeping up on you, Peter. It's, it's, uh, there you go. It's, it's, I think it is. It's, it's, it's the big five. Oh, isn't it? What the heck was I going to say? Oh, I know what it was. Yeah, that's um, okay. one thing that um, I think we've all been asking for in teams for a long time, which is finally here, which is great to see as the inline responses in the, in the oh, yeah. chat. Can you um, sort of tell us what, what the journey of that was? What, why that was a particular challenge? Can you give us any sort of behind the scenes of, of, of why that was difficult for so long? I don't great, know. Great. I really don't know. I know it's something folks have been asking for and you know, we're like, hey, this is finally done and all that. I don't know why it was so difficult. I, I mean, the problem is, is, Teams is still an API of sorts over mm. SharePoint and OneDrive. And it sort of mm. translates all that at the base of it. And our goal is to sort of separate that out and turn it into its own app, which will reduce the resources needed for it and allow it to connect with those, but not be built as sort of a GUI on top of that. Um, so some of those things get more difficult to do. And as we can start to separate the product base and make a better code, like now being able to bring in active elements, which I love, where you can bring in the spreadsheet and everybody can work on it within mm -hmm. chat at the same time and things like that. That's all part of the new framework that's being built out. So I think a lot of it depends on us moving to this newer framework, which will happen and we should continually see a reduction in resources and hopefully get to a point where it's reasonable because that's the biggest criticism I get. And I agree, it is a mm -hmm. resource hog and that is something yeah. we're, we're working on. And each year at Ignite, when we take a look, it should be less and less. But it's a journey for us to really sort of build out that platform to the way that we'd like it. So it'll take some time. But I could find out more. I'll find out more for you on that. Yeah, no, it was so many people were happy to see that, including me. It's, it's mm. a great feature. It's a little I thing agree. sometimes. It's, yeah. Um, for sure. Uh, what, so thinking back to, to the, the team show you do, uh, one question I want to run by you. Uh, one of the stories that kind of sticks in my mind it was one of the first ones I, I remember watching, actually. Uh, and it was a, uh, an episode that was focused on security. And you held that show with uh, Chris Jackson, yeah. uh, who sadly is no longer with us. But he was a big part of the security community, Microsoft 365 community. And I was just wondering if you could maybe share some uh, memories of Chris for folks that aren't aware about Chris. Can you let us know a little bit about him? Yeah. And then also the kind of legacy that, you're uh, kind of managing with Chris and as far as I'm aware, there's a scholarship you know program what? in his name. I just did a, um, we're about to move into what we call our give month, uh, which is where we ask all of our employees to pick a cause or something like that and give. And we do a lot of things around this and we raise billions of dollars for a variety of charities every year. And it's amazing to see everybody get back. And I'm championing Chris's cause for those who didn't know Chris, Chris was, um, Chris was an amazing guy and a really good friend of mine. Um, sadly, the anniversary of his death comes up this month, uh, at the end of the month. But um, at, he uh, was well known, always took time for folks at conferences, was just one of the most personal people. But one of the things that people don't know about Chris is it took him six, seven years to get his computer science degree. He actually had a degree in psychology and wanted to go study computer science. And would go to school for a semester and then take some time off to work and save money and then go back to school. And it took him five, six years to get that degree. Uh, and when he passed, a lot of us were feeling just this big hole. And I wanted to feel that, um, you know, we could do something that made a difference. So I sat down with his wife and she's like, I think we should start a scholarship to make it easier for people to get this computer science degree. So let me do this. Let me, um, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, oh, go for it. So let me share screen. And I'm going to share that one. Share. Cool. And I will bring this up. Can you guys see that? Yeah, wait, we can do it if we add to stream. There we go. Yeah, that's now on the All screen. Right. Awesome. So um, Chris was at Microsoft for 15 years, and he was one of the best cybersecurity experts across IE, Windows, et cetera. He mentored over 40 employees worldwide, which a lot of folks don't know. Um, he died. He was on a bicycle trip in the Carolinas and uh, had a burst brain embolism that um, caused him to fly off his bicycle. And he was in a coma vegetative state and passed shortly after. 
But as I said, it took them a long time to get that degree. So we raised a really good amount of money and we're able to give two $5,000 scholarships each year. And what's interesting is, is if you've ever applied for a scholarship and I did a bunch with my daughter, they're like 500 to a thousand dollars, giving away $5,000, um, is a lot of money enough for somebody to pay for a semester or even two semesters of school. Um, so that's been incredibly rewarding. And uh, some of my favorite pictures with Chris over the years, there we are up in uh, Amsterdam. And I think that's New Orleans with the beads. Uh, mm -hmm. There's uh, Daniel Van uh, Daniel Van Sot and Tony Kynan from the Netherlands. There's Mark Rasinovich and Jeffrey Snover uh, and a whole bunch of us and just all oh, the wow, time. Yeah, yeah that's over a great the full of you guys. You get Rasinovich in there, yeah. you get Snover in there, wow. Yeah, Aaron Margosis. Most and, and fantastic. Yeah, and down at the bottom too. There's Mark. Uh, there's uh, you know Jeffrey and a whole bunch of us. So we would do what we call a geek dinner after our internal conference, uh, Microsoft Ready, and uh, we would do what we call geek dinner. So we all get together and do a big dinner, and it was always great. And I love the picture down at the bottom because Chris loved ice cream, and we were in Las Vegas, and I'm like, well, we have to go to this place that has what they call the cookie shake, and he thought it was just a cookie made into the shake. <laughs> it is with a gigantic ice cream cookie on top of it that is close to the size of his head. So um, <laughs> yeah, he, he ate that whole thing, and he ate it happily. And then uh, the picture of me with the Mickey Mouse shirt and Chris, that was at my 50th birthday party, which he flew out from Chicago, which is where I grew up, uh, to come to my 50th, which was great. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, so we're in bold.org, um, the Bold Foundation. If you go to bold.org and you type in Chris Jackson, you will see the, um, the scholarship fund. Uh, this is one from our internal portal, but you can go to bold.org and type it in. You'll see it. And uh, we get a complete match uh, also from Microsoft. So they do a matching donation on this. And twice a year, we're giving um, that scholarship away to uh, eligible uh, computer science students. We had um, three, almost 400 applications for which we picked five finalists and one winner. And we just mm -hmm. announced the winner on Friday. So uh, I have a call with that person on Monday. So I'm very excited. Oh, amazing. Oh, nice. nice. That's such yeah, a nice was, way to kind of remember someone, great. right, and set their legacy. Love yeah, that. and it's great because Karen and her two daughters, Lily and Abby, um, they go through, they pick folks, and then my wife and my daughter also go through and pick, and then they get together and they say, here's our finalist. I don't get involved in that uh, in any way, shape, or form. I just pass that on and, and kind of manage it. But it's been a really, it's been a good way to heal for a lot of us. And it was great because we all finally got together and did a geek dinner because uh, we haven't been able to do one uh, because of COVID. And since Chris mm -hmm. passed, so we got together a few weeks ago, myself, Mark, Jeffrey, a whole bunch of us, and uh, and did a saramaki and did a dinner. And it was really nice just to see everybody in person. And we went around and told our favorite Chris story. So <laughs> nice. some of them, which are not so PC, are meant for family. Shows. <laughs> that was the kind of guy that, that Chris was. And we appreciate that. So Chris was great. Chris would come over and grab my butt and give me a kiss on the cheek and call me honey. And <laughs> I would roll right with it because that was kind of guy. But like I said, even wearing those teddy bear shoes and everything else, if he was walking at Ignite or at any conference and somebody walked up to stop him, he would give them always his full attention, 100% and talk to them whatever they needed and would sit with them as long. And that's an amazing thing for a person. He was very, very well read. And actually he gave me the most challenging presentation I ever did. He decided that at our ready conference we were each going to do a presentation we had five minutes we had to pick a topic and the slide automatically changed every 20 seconds oh <laughs> so you got to stick on time right you don't have a choice and i've done thousands of presentations hundreds of keynotes it was the hardest presentation i've ever done because you have to within the first minute like a bullet out of a gun hit your topic hit it good get people engaged and make them want to hear the whole story and tell the story in a very, very short way. And your slides could not have any text on them. They could only be visuals. Mm, right, I, right. I finally ended up scrapping the whole thing and rewriting it the night before at about 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> I was happy with it. And Chris said, oh, by the way, since you're one of our better presenters, uh, I've made you clean up hitter. So you're on last. And I'm like, oh, great. Oh, so, great. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was awesome. And it was a great experience. And Chris was that type of person who was like, I'm going to push you a little bit because uh, I pushed myself. And he was good about that, but never in a way that everybody just scared. Like, 
you're going to do this. I know you can. And I got your back and uh, I, I miss him terribly. Mm. Awesome. Oh, well, what a wonderful legacy that you've created in his memory. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. fantastic. I, I, will, I will share this. You'll appreciate this. His wife mm-hmm. asked me if there was anything of his that I wanted. And I'm like, uh, Chris was learning how to play guitar. And like me with bass was not that good, but loved to do it. And I asked for one of Chris's guitars. And it is here in my office. Oh, there cool. it is. And wow. it is actually a Jackson Idol. guitar, which I love, nice. uh, with a whole bunch of pictures of Chris and I inside of there. And there's my, I don't know, I met OMD and I met the B-52s and <laughs> that's the drumstick from Rock Lobster. But Chris I was about to say right B-52s is Rock Lobster, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Nice. In there, the, that, that's the drumstick, which I was handed when they played. Wow. They signed it for me. I have OMD there, Toto. And then behind me, there's a sign, things from Rush and journey and brian eno and if anybody knows who he is oh uh, well I'm like, when, he did one of the windows startups am i right he, he did. did he yeah, did so. yeah but he also produced low lodger heroes he produced the first uh you know uh, a lot of u2 ultravox devo he's one of the greatest producers and musicians on the planet and somebody i loved him one of the mvp said i'm doing a thing setting up some security stuff and window stuff at his at his studio I know oh, you're man. a big fan. Do you want me to try to get an autograph? I'm like, oh, yeah, I have a, yeah. So, uh, and I have a signed Brian Eno album. So that and wow. my Russian Cure Bass, uh, you know, those are like my 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 babies. I have the I have the the Rush 40th anniversary bass, which I got as a 50th birthday gift. And this is uh, one of my favorites. This is my new baby. This is the Schechter. Um, uh, Simon Gallup bass, which actually says on the back the Cure. Oh yeah, see it. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Nice black it there. is. Yeah, awesome. it's really beautiful, and I even got a custom guitar strap with Robert Smith's face on it made. But yeah, I love these things. So, and Chris and I would try to jam together over the air and stuff like that. So I was going to say, I thought I noticed in one of the photos. I don't know if it was the ice cream photo, but one of them he had. <laughs> the, 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 he was he was repping the Def Leppard T-shirt. I oh think yeah, no, no, he, yeah. He was a yeah. big rock guy like me. So yeah, Def Leppard, Guns and Roses, all that sort mm. of stuff. And I like even more of the heavier core stuff at times in the old punk rock i'm an old punk rock guy but yeah wow. uh we were always sit there and chat about music and jam out to stuff and i'd make him playlists and send them off to him and vice versa so yeah i miss his energy and his and his humor and he was just always a really good friend and always there and ready to listen so um the world is a better place for having him and if any of the people out there had a chance to engage with him i'm sure you would agree so he uh, he's left big shoes so i'm trying to fill what i can and do my part and be on anybody's show and talk to anybody and help anybody that needs help. I am always here for them via Twitter. If anybody ever has questions about Microsoft or products or mentoring or whatever, feel free to reach out. I'm always available for that sort of stuff and happy to do it. Awesome. That's really nice to hear. And I guess what we'll do is uh, we'll make sure when we're putting out the the show, we'll put in the show notes, just kind of find you on Twitter, Mm -hmm. find you online. Absolutely. Sure, we'll get that added in there. And I, I guess just to kind of continue on that conversation about music, um, mm. I, can't, I think we were talking about it before the show went to air, or we might just be repeating ourselves for the for the okay. listeners and viewers. But uh, you mentioned that you kind of uh, picked up uh, the bass guitar, and that's not something you've done your whole life, is it? That's kind of no. Weird. I, I was right? I was very much into music in high school and college, and then it kind of dropped away as I got into IT. And uh, at fifty, I said, "I'm going to learn how to play bass. I love the bass. Bass lines and songs are my favorite, and I'm attracted to songs from." In excess to New Order to you know really great oh, Metallica or the yeah. Trooper from you know uh, you no, know more Iron Maiden. To mind when you I think love about bass Motorhead. I'm a, oh, dude, I'm yeah. a huge yep. Lemmy fan. You can't see, but up there, I have a bunch of pops up on the ceiling, and there's two Lemmy yep, pops, too. and then there's Lemmy again up on the shelf in the back awesome. next to my Rush guy. So no, <clears> I'm <throat> a big Lemmy fan. Yeah. So yeah, being able to play, you know, Ace of Spades and stuff along that line. So I decided I wanted to play bass and I realized I'm not very good, at, um, but I, I love to try to play. I'm using Rocksmith, which I found was a great way to learn how to play, which is a great piece of software for the Xbox or PC. And you can okay. load in songs and it teaches you. Um, but the thing that I really love about it is because I'm not that great, I really have to focus when I'm trying to learn how to play a song. If I take 30 minutes, my whole brain will shift to that side and I'll really try to work it out and get it good and get my fingers. It's more my fingers just don't do what I want them to do. But when I come back, if I've had an issue that I was working on and couldn't solve it, I'll go play music. When I come back, my brain goes, oh, hey, I figured it out while you were away. Uh, solve this. 
it allows my brain to sort of go off with subconsciously to solve things or to figure things out. So I find it's mm -hmm. really great as an emotional tool, as a business tool to just sort of take that break and go off and let your mind go in a different direction. So it's incredibly therapeutic. And for someone mm -hmm. I have, um, I have ADD and ADHD. So for me being able to get my brain in a different direction and get it focused on something like that um, becomes really, really important for me and my mental health to come back to that. So I encourage people, it's never too late to start. If you're passionate, you want to try to paint or draw or play music, or whatever, even if you suck, if you're enjoying it and you have fun, do it. It is, uh, it is all that matters. To your mental health. That's all that matters. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whatever it is. Fantastic. Some of those musicians you rattled off there are right up my street. And I know it will be Ruse as well, but I think we're we're all kindred spirits. But one that stuck out to me there greatly, um, a particular favorite of mine was New Order, previously oh, Joy Division. Yeah. They, they were I obsessed with those those guys. I love I those guys them. too. Peter Peter Hook was the, I'm sad that Peter's no longer with the bass because his bass lines, especially <laughs> on things like Perfect Kiss and stuff like that, were just insane. Mm. And I had a chance to see him on Low Life and Brotherhood, um, which wow. was great. I saw in one year, I saw them on Brotherhood and I saw the Cocteau twins like the same year. So that was like yeah. Ah. But um, seeing them live and watching Peter, he would get down with his bass and he would play it like below his knees. He looked like yeah. a, just the seven foot tall gorilla playing bass, but he was mm. so powerful. And I love New Order and I love a lot of their stuff without Peter. I thought um, mm. the Waiting for the Sirens Call album was a really great album and stuff along that line. But his bass riffs are just monstrous and some mm. of the best parts of New Order. And I think it's funny when I look back I love songs and bands that have great bass lines. You know, God of Thunder, Children mm -hmm. of the Grave, when you're looking at Kiss or Black Sabbath, The Trooper by Iron Maiden, Motorhead. If you want to hear a great Motorhead mm -hmm. song, and I'm a big fan of the Foo Fighters too, uh, mm -hmm. check out the song um, Shake Your Blood by Probot. That is Lemmy and Dave Dave Grohl on bass. Wow. Right. Lemmy, yeah. playing, uh, Lemmy playing bass, Dave Grohl playing drums, and I forget mm -hmm. who's playing guitar, but he did a whole album with a bunch of guest artists. Mm -hmm. And that song is just a killer. It just I it think I've seen that actually. Yeah. Yeah. I do think I've seen with that. The suicide girls that were big fans of them. So Lemmy's and mm -hmm. Hey, just loving it. But um, it's really, really great. And yeah. I think, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Tony Kynan is also a huge Motorhead fan. And he mm -hmm. kind of just does, he's, you know, he and I are of the same. Uh, we're Motorhead and we play rock and roll. You show up, you do it. And when I get on stage, it's like, that's what I do. I get up, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to play rock and roll, but I'm going to say it and do it and get you engaged and excited and happy. And that's mm. what you do. It's it's no frills, you know? It's not, I'm not going to throw a lot of marketing crap after, out of you. We're going to have fun. We're going to dig into what you want to do and we're going we're gonna to go. So mm. the Motorhead attitude, we are Motorhead and we play rock and roll. That does well. So yeah, yeah. I got a lot of great memories about Motorhead. I uh, We were quite fortunate basically for... All, I think it was basically every November for the best part of eight, nine, ten years, they played every single year at the uh, O2 Arena in Glasgow. Wow. Uh, well, not the O2 Arena, Carling Academy, as it was called back then. So wow. it was like every year you had this tradition of getting to see Motorhead. And the wow. great thing about it was, yeah. and I remember Lemmy talking about this, and he said, we don't play that many new song because we're putting out albums every two years but we don't yeah. play the whole album every two years because when you come to see Morehead, you come to see ace of spades you come to see iron fist all that good stuff right. so we'll throw some of the new stuff in there but you can get that experience where some bands you go to see them and they just play the new album and it's like yeah, yeah come on chuck out the no. old stuff you know? yeah <laughs> and they were good about going deep in their catalog on stuff i had a i had the good fortune um i was in chicago and i was writing music reviews for a local paper and it was motorhead and slayer nice, okay nice, motorhead nice. on the orgasmatron tour which i think is one of their <laughs> best albums ever and slayer on mm. rain and blood and i had a chance to interview lemmy which was again one of the highlights sure. so i get backstage and i had done a review of the album and i had said imagine taking a human being's voice drink mm. a full bottle of Jack Daniels, then drag it down <laughs> a road behind a pickup truck filled with rocks oh. and glass and put <laughs> yeah. it back in the man's <laughs> mouth. And that's what Lemmy sounds like. And I go backstage and I go, you know, hello, Mr. Kill, Mr. How are you? It's great to meet you. He goes, call me Lemmy. I'm like, hi, Lemmy. And he goes, <laughs> Stephen Rose, Stephen Rose. Oh, wait a minute. I know that name. And he goes, 
you wrote that review about the glass in the road. He said, yeah, he goes, have a drink with me. And we drank Jaeger. He, he, wow. I'm like, you don't say no to, Yem to Lemmy. So I was backstage about a half know. hour drinking some Jaeger That's and watching awesome. all the other folks. I met Filthy Animal Taylor, you know, and it was just, it was a great moment. So I had a chance to meet the man and shake his hands. But wow. losing Lou Reed, David Bowie, and Lemmy all within... Mm. You know, and then yeah. Neil Pierre, Neil Pierre last year, but losing those three within such a short period of time, three of just my yeah. musical muses uh, was yeah. really, yeah, it was just so hard. Yeah. Um, you know, losing all three of those guys. So, well, yeah, well, even Slayer completely. that you mentioned there, you know, yeah. Slayer, no, they, they don't play live anymore. No, uh, they're and done. Tom Mariah's done, and Carrie King, who. Yeah. You know, is such a force on stage, and so yeah. great to say. Yeah. He and could do a whole music show. Jeff Enneman, you know what I mean? That was mm. that was horrible. That was, hearing that about was him. Tough. Yeah, even tougher than 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 Daryl Dimebag, where Daryl had a great sound, but Jeff was very much the backbone of that band, and I can't yeah, imagine totally them great. playing "Rain and Blood" and you know some of the other songs that that they've done over the years, just to that mm. to that level that they did with it. Same with like you know, I was lucky I saw Rush on their final tour. Um, oh, cool. and which is great. I saw them and it was awesome. And I'm like, I'm, I didn't know what was their final tour, but I'm like, I'm going to buy great seats. And we got like seventh row on the floor. We were like very, very close. And it was amazing. And I was so happy later looking back on that going, we were at the, one of the last rush shows. We saw it, we were up close, we could see Getty and we were like right there in his face and the whole thing. And I'm all for it. go to less shows, but get the great seats, get the packages do the whole thing. I saw Primus a few weeks ago. They were doing Farewell to Kings uh, as their middle section, and I got a signed poster and all that sort of stuff. And the Foo Fighters just announced a show here in Seattle that they're doing for as a part of a benefit. Uh, for, and if you are a fan in their fan club, you got a chance to go. So we'll go see them. But I'm like, go to less shows, pay the money, and go get the full experience. Sit close, see the artist, get mm. the backstage thing. I would rather do one show a year like that than go to 10 shows where, you know, there's just a ton of folks, but go, don't yeah. put it off because you don't know yeah. where, you know, if these folks are going to be around in the future. Yeah. It's a and good point. Put your uh, damn you phone away as well. well. Yeah. Enjoy put your it. phone away and just <laughs> close your eyes and enjoy the music. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are so many moments where I was catch a show and I can think of like the Cocteau Twins, I can think of Rush, I can think of, you know, so many different bands where, you know, just close your eyes and you listen to a full song and just mm -hmm. let it take you over. And you can go back to that moment and you can remember that um, so well. For me, it was the first time I saw New Order perform Your Silent Face, mm -hmm. which was just awesome to hear live and to do that track and just sort of feel it filling you up so i'm i'm all for that sort of stuff yeah, yeah. one of my favorite new order performances live is and you can find this on youtube quite easily still is they were at the hacienda the legendary hacienda Ooh. in manchester uh, in 1985 performing sunrise and hooky was oh. doing exactly as you described with the yeah. bass guitar he was just playing it low and it's oh, such an amazing yeah. performance one of my favorites. I, I absolutely love that. But uh, they were influenced heavily by Bowie, as were many people. Of oh, God, yeah. was a massive influence on uh, people oh, yeah. like well, them and Roxy Music and Adam and the Ants, all those sort of people. Well, you look at all the Manchester bands that came out of there. The Smiths were very much like that. Echo and the Bunnymen <laughs> wanted to be the Doors with some Bowie yeah. thrown in. So, yeah. yeah, when you throw that. All right, let's go around. Love Echo and the One album that everybody has to listen to rue you start what is one album if you have never listened to this album from beginning or end is an album that you should listen to and then peter you're going to get the same question here oh man yeah. that's tough well it is a tough and you can only pick one up this is an album where you go if you've never listened to this album from beginning then whatever put it on listen to it and chances are it might change your life a little bit man so moorhead's my favorite band but i'm gonna go judas priest and I'm going to say British Steel because Ooh. there's something about that album. And in particular, actually, there was a live recording version of that album at, can't remember the name of the arena, Seminole something or other down in Florida, I believe. Yeah. And it is so good. Just the perfect live album. The, the bass to kind of play yeah. to your interests. So good. Uh, Ian Hill, I think, is Judas Priest's bass player. The yeah. Rage 
Oh my god, so good, so good. I could That's talk awesome. forever about that. Yeah, li Live and Unleashed in the East is another really good live pre yes, Like the version absolutely. of Green Man Alishi with the two prong which yeah. most people do not know is a, is a Fleetwood Mac song. Yeah, it's not a priest song. Yeah. No, not a but They made it, no, for no. sure. They, made yeah. it, they truly made it their own. All right, Peter, your turn. I'm I'm sort of torn between two. Uh, All right, well, what are your two? You can, you can have two, I guess. Okay, Joy Division... Unknown pleasures, of course, would be would be one because that early Joy Division sound, which then, sadly, because of the loss of Ian Curtis, they became yeah. New Order. Uh, two very different experiences, but but that early Joy Division yeah. stuff was so so influential on me. Um, there's a really good movie about or a couple of good movies about their story. Actually, Twenty Four Hour Party People, starring starring yes. Steve Coogan, love mm -hmm. that film. And the other one, which is in black and white, called Control. Yep. Two very different interpretations of the Ian Curtis story or the Tony Wilson Factory Records story. Yeah. Um, the other album, which I absolutely yeah. love, um, which I also happen to know is the favorite album of all time of Adam and the Ants guitarist Marco Peroni. Marco Peroni, is sure. Really great, really great, legendary guitarist. Love him. Um, mm -hmm. That would be Roxy Music for your pleasure. Oh, I love Roxy Music. I'm a huge mm -hmm. Roxy music fan and a bummer. I've never, I've seen Brian, but I never saw mm -hmm. Roxy when they were together. So that yeah, was one of those. Be something, wouldn't it? So what's your steam? Yeah. Over to you. Um, if I had to pick one album, I would say queen live killers. Oh, wow. That is an album that when you realize no synthesizers were on that album, you get to hear mm -hmm. Freddie's voice just beautifully. Brian May's phenomenal guitar work. John Taylor does a kettle drum solo. I mean, <laughs> does a freaking kettle drum <laughs> solo. Uh, you know, and John just holding the whole thing together as an album. I remember listening to that over and over and over again and going, wow. And you could visualize the performance because of how Freddie did things and pulled things together in his voice and how he cared about the audience. It was a very, very influential album for me because that got me really appreciating a variety of instruments. And then that's when I went, well, what's this punk rock thing? And I started with, you know, The Clash and Sex Pistols and Big, mm. uh, you know, and um, uh, Black Flag and went down that direction. I went into kind of, I went down the Bauhaus, Susie, Joy Division. Susie. And then I went, awesome. yeah. And then, I, and then I went old school metal with, you know, Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and all those and love all of that stuff. And when I do, my playlists are all over the place. Like, <laughs> yes. A Susie song that I just, <laughs> a Susie song that I just refound is um, her version of Trust in Me, uh, which is on the, the Through the Looking oh, the Glass Book. album, which is from the Jungle Book. And I yeah. refound it, and it is a brilliant version with Budgie just doing some amazing work on it in her voice. But once you hear it, you're going to go, I want to hear that again. Like you replay it yeah. like four or five times. It is just this amazing little groove that they pick and they just ride inside of. So yeah, we, we, we should do a music show. We could sit here and talk about music all day. We could talk about producers, you know, and great stuff like that. I would love Absolutely. that. But we could even use Teams really. with its high fidelity music we option, could. I believe. Yeah, as a matter of <laughs> fact, you, you guys will appreciate this. I grew up in Chicago, so I took all of the old posters for bands that I saw, and you'll see down here is, I saw Joy Division. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, there's Naked Ray nice idea. Like that. Yep, the Dickies, Husker Du, Wire, he's Sonic Youth, yep. Ministry, Front 242, Nick Cave, Dead Kennedys, Red Cross. These are all bands that I saw and I'd collected these for years oh, nice. and then just um, put them up as a, uh, brought them into Photoshop and then um, sent it out and had a big poster made of it. But it just brings me back to my time in Chicago and seeing all those bands when they were cheap and nobody knew them. And for 10 bucks, you could go see a double bill with, you know, Husker Du and some other band and go, who are these guys? And just have your head blown off watching, you know, a, a powerful trio on stage <laughs> doing this sort of stuff and, or Motorhead coming in with some band that you had never heard of opening up for them who ended up mm -hmm. going on to become <clears throat> something big. So it was always great to go do. Yeah, totally. Agree. Awesome. No, love it. Uh, oh, and good. I guess, you know, there's, we uh moving away from music but sticking in the same kind of arena. Uh we've got an obligatory question arena. that we have to ask all guests. Okay. Uh and that is uh uh <laughs> we're we're kinda action movie geeks, myself and Pete, I think that's fair to say. And mm -hmm. there's a debate going on 
consistently throughout the show, and that is which is the better film, Terminator One or Terminator Two? So, Stephen, yeah, I, I, I thought you were going to you... say Alien or Aliens, and I was going to go, right. oh, that's because you know, great track. You can't. That one can't be decided, but this one can, and there is uh, a right and wrong answer. Yeah. So, <laughs> I would, I, I would actually say the first one because it was so unique and groundbreaking. Although the effects today yeah, look a little awesome. janky, and the effects in the second one were mind blowing, but I think getting your head around that idea and that whole killing Hitler's baby thing and taking it to that level, I thought was absolutely yeah. brilliant. I thought this is great and, you know, not something I expected. It's got some really good action sequences in it. Uh, I would absolutely say the first one, uh, James Cameron knocked it out of the park with that one and set up a lot of great actors who went on to a lot of success afterwards in that film. Yeah. Well, so well Kat, who also runs the show with us, she's, Proper, I was almost say die hard into it, but that would kind of confuse things. <laughs> then, then we get into a whole <laughs> <other>. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no. Mm. But she, she, she comments that the reason she prefers the first one is kind of that horror element to it, which I yeah. totally understand it is a bit more uh, terrifying, right? It's like you've yeah. got this, you've it's got... like Alien and Aliens. Alien yeah. Exactly is the same, a isn't it? Yeah, good point. Horror yeah. film. Ridley Scott did a great job. The second one, done by James Cameron of Terminator, does a really good action film. So, and you're right. The second one is more of an action film. The first one is more of a horror suspense. You know, it's going to get its chasing kind of thing. So yeah, I, I would absolutely pick the first one, but it was the first in that genre and it did it really, really well. Yeah. It's like, no, completely did, didn't it? But um, before we wind things up, I, I would just like to talk, if, if, if we may, just for a few moments. We've, we've already touched on it, that you're a big advocate and supporter of uh, neurodiversity, mental health, and, uh, and, yeah. and you, have, you mentioned that you have ADHD. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit more about what that means to you and uh, on what sort of things we can all do to, to support and amplify uh, the, the message of, uh, of these sort of things, um, especially through technology like Teams? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing, and this is something I've learned in having a daughter, a daughter that is also neurodiverse, um, hmm. everybody learns differently. Hmm. Everybody learns differently. And when we go in to go do a speech or do something, there are some people like my daughter has an issue where when she hears something, it takes her brain a moment to unscramble it. Think of dyslexia, but, or, but orally, that sometimes things will get backwards. Plus she has a little hmm. dyslexia. Um, it's really hard. So giving people different ways to ingest what you do, I'm going to do a PowerPoint, but I am going to have transcription up or I'm going to have it mm. below running in real time. If so, I will not ask people to make a decision, I will give them time to go back through the recording or back through the transcription and to go, to go do that. I'm not going to put too much on slides. I'm going to talk mm. to it, but keep it simple and keep it to my bullet points. Be aware of colors that can affect people and moods. Running the accessibility checker on a PowerPoint is a really simple thing that you can do. But, mm. uh, you know, doing a meeting that you could do in person, do it in person, but have teams on so that people can chat, can go back and forth and try to make those meetings inclusive. Those are some of the simple things that people can do, but often don't think to because we get very used to doing things one way. But just think about inclusivity and am I making, am I giving everybody the same level platform to be heard in what it is that we're doing and to have the same experience that I have, even if they can't process it the same way that I can. And that's probably the best thing. And there's a ton of tools in there. You've got to figure out which ones are best for you and your audience, especially if you have English as a second language uh, and mm. things like that. That can be difficult for people. What is the best way to do it? And I now point out when I'm doing slideshows, hey, you know, you can do this. And when I'm doing a, like an EBC for someone where English is a second language, I love the feature in PowerPoint where you can have it do the real time translation. And it will translate into any one of 36 languages. I have that running while I talk and they freak out. How are you doing that? Oh, it's built in. Is mm. it tuned to your voice? I'm like, no, you come up and you talk and I flip it and there it is coming up in English and they're blown away. But I'm like, it just makes it easier for them to see in their own language what I'm saying and then ask the appropriate question. So just be thoughtful of that and just be mindful and mm. don't feel bad. Hey, would somebody, you know, would it help anybody if I turn on transcription or translation or just do it and assume that some that's probably the best advice around it and we have a great page on that you can go to our um we have several pages about um on our that talks about mm -hmm. this the features i love the the new kit that we have for surface that really helps 
that are um, physically disabled to better work with the service devices and open mm. up the tabs and set the accessibility kit. And I love that we're doing more and more things like that as a company. So that makes me really happy. Mm. And I was uh, say, just ask questions. I mean, as, as a parent to a, a, a child with autism, um, I talk a lot about it. I'm an open book. I'm not everybody is not everyone's comfortable, but I wear my no. heart on my sleeve and I, I like to talk about it because it helps me. It, it, it's, it's an outlet for me. So I would say to people, if you want to know something about my life and, 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 my, my life with Oliver, who's got very severe autism, sensory processing disorder, and uh, pathological demand avoidance. But just ask me. I'll tell you. So yeah, uh, never be afraid. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It is hard. My daughter has a lot of that, too, like really bright lights or loud <laughs> sounds, or like she can't go to a Costco. The lights are too bright. Mm. There's too much going on there. It's just too overwhelming for her uh, on a sensory level. So we're aware of these types of things and say, okay, you don't have to go or we'll go shortly or set that expectation of what's going to happen or try to avoid those situations. So it's hard when she watches movies, she has to watch it with the subtitles, even if it's in English, because it just mm -hmm. helps her with her oral processing. So yeah, I, I agree, Peter. I think it's great. I think if more people just say, look, this is the issue and ask me questions and be open honest, that's how we help people around this sort of thing. So I applaud mm -hmm. you for doing that. Mm -hmm. We have several friends that have similar issues and they're really open about it. And I think that's what makes the difference is let's get rid of some of the stigmas and mm. I have a problem and this is what I do and this is how I manage it. And life is hard and exhausting sometimes, but it's what I do and I'm not expecting you to cut me any slack for it, but do understand that I have this and I'm doing my best. And if there's something you think I can do and do better, let me know. Exactly. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I guess that's a really thing, good place it? to end. I was going to yeah, say, exactly. does, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what better up. place to end? Absolutely. But before we go, um, just one final words from you, Stephen. Is there anything you'd like to to sign off with and, and let people know how they can how they can find you, how they can reach you if they want to get in? Touch? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For for our show, go to aka.ms slash inside. MS Teams. We'll, I know you guys will put that up at some point. So yeah. check that out. I'm always reachable on Stephen L. Rose on Twitter. So you're welcome to grab me there or, you know, through any of the MVP or Ignite stuff. I'm always happy to chat with folks. Reach out if you want to get in a call. Hey, I could use some career advice, things like that. I'm happy and I'm happy to connect you with any one of our great MVPs that are always happy to do exactly the same thing. So whatever we can do to help you, please let us know. Amazing. Awesome. Stephen, you've been so generous with your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. We we really must make that music thing happen at some point because that we could just I would love that. Absolutely. Music the three of us. Let's let's just do that anyway. <laughs> I point. think we should. I think we should call it ten <laughs> songs. And we pick ten songs that if you listen to these ten songs mm -hmm. by we'll pick an artist each week that they will change your life or by a producer or around a theme. I think we should do that. I think there that would be a lot like of that. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, talk. let's week. make this happen. <laughs> I would call Absolutely. for that. Love that. Awesome. Love that. Well, Rue, anything from you finally before we say? Nope. Goodbye? All good. Again, thank you both gentlemen for your time. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and like Stephen already mentioned, links to all the social media, the websites, uh, the show, I'll put them all in the YouTube description. Cool. That sounds awesome. And hey, what I will do is I just got these. I'm going to show these off on your show. Nobody has seen these yet, but I got. Ooh, exclusive. Look, really cool stickers for my yes. show. Oh, and I will send a bunch wow. off to you guys along with some T-shirts. So I will get those out. So I'll grab your address. Oh, yeah. but you could be the Amazing. first people to get these cool inside Microsoft Teams stickers. Ooh, there you go. Swag. Love it. Love, swag. Love, yep. <laughs> love some good Thank swag. you so, so yeah, much. So we'll grab some stuff. We'll get it. And then you can show it off when we're at Ignite. We shall nice. certainly Love do it. that without a doubt. Thank you so much, my friend. Um, we shall Thank leave you, it John. there. This has been Cloud Conversations. Um, catch us on YouTube. I think I've memorized the URL now, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Cloud Conversations. Hit us up on the Twitter at um, CloudCons365. I think we are now. We recently changed it. I'm just getting used to that. But uh, if you want to get in touch, let us know your thoughts on the show, any, any ideas you have. If you want to be a guest on the show, just ask us and uh, come, come and come and talk to us. We're, we're not hard to find. So you take care um, and enjoy the rest of your, your days and we'll catch you down the road. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers.